Screen readers are one of the numerous assistive technologies available to users. Learn what screen readers are, what options are available based on your operating system, and some common features and navigation techniques. A screen reader is an assistive technology designed to make digital content accessible to people with visual impairments. Screen readers convey information by converting text into synthesized speech, which can be heard through computer speakers or headphones. There are several screen reader options available, but they all generally work in the same manner. When a user navigates to a web page or opens a document, the screen reader reads out the content of the page in the order they are presented in the HTML. This allows the user to listen to the text and interact with the content using a series of navigation techniques. Since most users of a screen reader are unable to navigate using a mouse, keyboard commands are commonly used instead. These commands include things like opening and closing programs, reading documents, and navigating web pages. Windows, Mac, and Linux all have native screen readers that are designed to work specifically with their respective operating systems. In the next couple of slides, we'll take a look at the available options, all of which are free to download and install. By default, Macs have a built-in screen reader called VoiceOver. As a result, no separate installation is required, and we'll look at how to perform basic commands in VoiceOver later in the lesson. On Windows, there is NVDA, which stands for Non-Visual Desktop Access. This is a free and open source screen reader that supports a wide range of applications and can be customized to meet individual needs. To install NVDA, navigate to the download page and scroll down until you see the download button. From here, you can follow the instructions to complete the installation process. Orca is a free and open source screen reader developed for Linux that provides access to the computer via user customizable combinations of speech and braille. For more information on Orca, you can check out the project's wiki and public GitLab repository links that are provided in the lesson manuscript. Now that we've covered the different screen readers for the respective operating systems, it's time to go over some basic commands to familiarize ourselves with this assistive technology. In the lesson manuscript, I provided a table of commands that we will be going through. Since I personally own a Mac, I'll show you how to use VoiceOver as an example. But don't worry if you're not using the same tool as me, as you can always check the instructions for your operating system screen reader and follow along that way. All right, I'm in the Chrome browser and on the ARIA Authoring Practices Guide website. You will see me reference this site a lot, and what better page to test than one that is intended for providing accessible component patterns. The first command I want to show is how to toggle VoiceOver on and off. And the shortcut for this is command F5. VoiceOver on Chrome. Patterns vertical line APG vertical line way vertical line W3C. To toggle it back off, incognito. we'll press command Window. F5 Patterns again. VoiceOver off. But of course, we want to actually test the screen reader, so let's toggle it back on. VoiceOver on Chrome. Patterns vertical line APG vertical line way vertical line W3C. Google entering patterns. To navigate between APG, flexible Z, items, you just press the tab key and VoiceOver guide. read out the flexible items in order. APG, to read the link, previously flexible item, press link, shift tab. APG home. Link. W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. Banner. VoiceOver can get a little chatty, so if you ever want to pause the voice at any time, press the control key. Next, I want to show how to navigate by heading. And the shortcut for this is Control Option Command H. Heading level one. Patterns. You are current. Heading level two. Read this first. You are accordion. Sections with show slash hide functionality. Link heading level two. To read the contents the within link. the section, link. you can press Control Accordion. Option Sections with show slash hide functionality. And this will read out the content within the card. Interactive headings that each contain so for the accordion card, it's going to read or thumbnail representing the description about the accordion. Content. Link heading level two alert. And then it'll navigate to the alert pattern card, and then read the content within the alert card. Next, I want to show how to open up the VoiceOver Rotor window. The shortcut for this is Control Option U. Links menu. Headings menu. And I'll navigate Form through the different menu. options that are Landmarks available. Landmarks menu. Windows spots menu. Links I want to go to a, the tabs link, so I'm going to spell tabs. Link. Link. And then link, press enter. Link. Heading level. And that'll take me directly to the tabs, tabs card. You are currently on to the navigate link. to the to page, link, I'll click enter. Tab. And now I'm on the tabs pattern content. page. Shortcut option plus zero button. If I wanted to navigate by image on a page, I would press control option command G. W3C web accessibility initiative. There's only link. one W3C image on this page, initiative. so we aren't going to get many options to iterate through. But if there are multiple images, voiceover would announce each one in the order that it's presented in the DOM. And that's a brief overview of how to use voiceover on a web page. You will examine and look at the characteristics of ARIA attributes, why they are essential for accessibility, and explore a few attributes and their specific use cases.
ARIA attributes can modify an element's states and properties within the accessibility tree. More on states and properties in a minute, by the way. By doing this, these attributes provide additional information about the purpose and function of elements on a web page, allowing assistive technologies like screen readers to convey this information to users more accurately. HTML elements inherently have accessibility semantics built in. However, there are instances where certain components, such as autocomplete inputs and tabs, don't have native elements available. Even with a native element, custom styling may be needed to fit a company's design system requiring a custom build. These nuances highlight the importance of having tools to add the necessary semantics for accessibility when they are not present or when a custom component is required. That being said, with great power comes great responsibility, quote from Spider-Man if you remember, and the MDN documentation on ARIA states and properties has a great note on this topic that reads, ARIA only modifies the accessibility tree, modifying how assistive technology presents the content to your users. ARIA does not change anything about an element's function or behavior. When not using semantic HTML elements for their intended purpose and default functionality, you must leave JavaScript to manage, you must use JavaScript to manage behavior, focus, and ARIA states. Long story short, this is just telling us that it is still our responsibility as developers to ensure that an element's promised behavior and functionality is delivered, and ARIA attributes are the tools you can leverage to keep this promise. So I wanted to dive deeper into some of the concepts I just mentioned. The first is that many HTML elements already have built-in semantics. And if possible, it's best that you use native HTML elements. And one of the reasons is that if we look at the select element, for example, an element I'm sure you've seen a lot or used yourself, it comes with native semantics and functionality built in. And in this particular use case, let's say we were to focus on the select element by tabbing into it, and then we press the down arrow, notice that the menu now opens up and presents us with a list of static options to choose from. And if we press the down arrow a couple times and select an option, it selects the option that was highlighted and shows it in the input there. And say we wanted to change the selection that we made, we press the down arrow again to open up the menu and then down arrow again to select a different option. You kind of get press enter to select it, you get the process. But those keyboard functionalities are built in. We didn't have to do anything. They just came out of the box. And that's what, that's what native H, using native HTML elements give you. So when you say you're building a custom element and you, you need to make sure that if you're building something that needs to mimic the select element, that those uh, functionalities are also included so that screen readers and people using your element, your custom component, still get the same functionality. And that's how ARIA can be leveraged to kind of help you do that. So the next example that I will show is actually, we'll go to the Google homepage. I'm sure you've all seen this. And this um, search bar here is actually what would be categorized as an autocomplete input. Um, you know, you search, it makes a, an asynchronous request, it presents you with results, that kind of thing. There's not a native HTML equivalent for this because the select element that we just saw is more for static options. But this, we kind of want something to be a little bit more dynamic. So in here, let's go ahead, I'm gonna search for ARIA and look that we get a couple results. And notice how the results are, are very, are kind of different. We have one that's just like a string of text, one that has like a picture, um, you know, uh, shows us Ariana Grande, the name, and then like a subtitle and all that. And so just, just kind of different variations that you can kind of customize there. And then if you were to like hover over certain options, notice that now on the right-hand side, we see a bigger picture of Ariana Grande and then a description of her and then another picture and, and the name. So all these kind of things, these are custom components that Google had to Google engineers had to kind of incorporate, but you don't just want it to look like the component, you also want it to function like how it is if you were using a native component. And so if we were to actually go in and inspect the this autocomplete input, let's actually take a look and see what they're kind of doing under the hood. So if we go in and inspect the element, we'll actually see that ARIA attributes are being leveraged. See it has a role of combo box right now. There's an ARIA active descendant, ARIA autocomplete, lots of ARIA attributes being used. Um, this is a kind of a complex, uh, 
component to implement. So, so if we look here, the text area element is actually being used, but ARIA attributes are being applied to that element so that it represents the combo box role. And so that the functionality works as one would expect if you were working with, say, like a native select or something like that. So just, just a real world example of how to kind of leverage ARIA attributes in the wild. So now we'll take a look at role states and properties as promised. Together, they enhance ARIA's functionality and make it a powerful tool for web accessibility. First, we'll look at roles, which are a core aspect of the ARIA system and represent a shorthand for defining a particular UI pattern. Roles achieve this by adding semantic meaning to the element that it's being applied to, which allows assistive technology to interpret the element in a way consistent with how the user expects a particular type of widget to work. Specific ARIA roles require corresponding ARIA states or properties, while some are only valid when combined with other roles. It should be noted that just adding a role does not make an element accessible. When a role is added to an element, the developer must ensure that they uphold the specifications that the role assumes and implement the pattern according to the ARIA authoring practices guide. So by default, many semantic elements have an implicit role assigned to them. For example, nav has an implicit ARIA role of navigation. And if we look at, go back to the select element that we looked at earlier and scroll down uh, to the technical summary section, which every element has, by the way, you can see that it has an implicit ARIA role defined here as combo box. And then there's some specifications about when it's a list box and yada, yada, yada. But anyway, you can see that within the documentation, it outlines what is the implicit ARIA role. And to kind of counteract this, let's look at a kind of more of a generic element like a span. And if you notice, there is no implicit ARIA role applied to it. So this is just kind of showing, comparing how specific, some elements do have a role assigned to them and some don't. Now we'll take a look at states and properties, which are similar in that they both provide specific information about an element and are used to help define the roles of ARIA. While both are treated as ARIA prefixed markup attributes, they have subtle differences in their meaning. States typically consist of attributes that have a higher likelihood of frequent changes due to user interaction, while properties tend to include attributes that are less likely to change. While it is useful to know the difference between states and properties to understand the composition of attributes better, these differences are not significant enough to consistently distinguish between the two terms. Therefore, you will use the term attributes to refer to states and properties going forward. Okay, so to kind of provide some examples for this, let's look at the ARIA states and properties page on MDN. And on this page, there are myriads of ARIA attributes. And you can see that they are categorized in different ways. And if you scroll down, there's just a ton of them. So we won't be able to cover all of them in this course, but this is just an example of all the ARIA attributes that you can leverage um, to help define the type of component you're trying to make. So let's take a look at one particular attribute, which is ARIA checked. This is an example of kind of a state. This type of attribute may change regularly based on the rate of when a checkbox is checked slash unchecked. Obviously, there's a checkbox native HTML element. So if you can, please leverage that. But let's say for some reason you had to implement your own checkbox. If we look at an example here on the ARIA Authoring Practices Guide and inspect the code, you will see that there is a role of checkbox and ARIA checked is equal to false for that first um, item there in the list. And if we go ahead and check it, we'll see that ARIA checked updates to true. And look at the second element, that's already true. If we go ahead and uncheck that, that becomes false. So this is kind of an idea of a, of a ARIA attribute that would be considered a state that gets updated depending on you know, the state of what's happening with that checkbox uh, component. Now let's explore some ARIA attributes. The first ARIA attribute we'll look at is ARIA label, which provides a descriptive label for interactive elements that might not have any visible label text associated with them, or when you want to apply a label that differs from an element's default accessible name. A common use case for ARIA label is to provide a label for an icon button that does not have any text associated with it. For example, a hamburger menu usually features an icon with three horizontal lines indicating that clicking it will display a drop-down menu. Since the icon doesn't include any text, an ARIA label could be provided to the allow screen readers to announce the button's purpose. So let's take a look 
at an example here, and we're actually going to steal the example from the ARIA label uh, documentation right here. And if we go ahead and open up the play sandbox that MDN now provides, um, we can use example taken here and look at what ARIA label does. Yeah, so let's copy the tech, the code here and let's go to the play environment and we'll paste it in and we see there's a little button with an X. And if we go and inspect, we will see that ARIA label says close. Because this is just an SVG, it doesn't have any text associated with it, ARIA label was applied and now the label of close has been applied. And if we go ahead and use our screen reader by pressing Command F5, opening that up, and click items. on the button, We'll see that the screen reader reads out close button. Close button. So without it, it would just read out button and something generic. So now that we've provided that ARIA label, um, person using assistive technology can have a little more context of what action the button will execute. The second attribute we look at is ARIA labeled by, which is considered a relationship attribute as it creates a semantic relationship between elements on the page. It achieves this by associating an element with an accessible label by referencing the ID of another element that contains the label text. This attribute can be used to provide a label for an element that doesn't have one by default. When the user interacts with the element associated with the ARIA labeled by attribute, the screen reader will announce the element's contents with the ID referenced by the attribute. ARIA labeled by and ARIA label both serve the purpose of providing an accessible label for interactive elements. However, it's important to note that ARIA labeled by takes precedence over all the other labels for an element. Therefore, using both ARIA label and ARIA labeled by on the same element is unnecessary and potentially confusing. To avoid confusion, use one or the other, but not both. And one way to kind of distinguish between the two is that ARIA label accepts a string of what will actually be read out as the label, while ARIA labeled by accepts an ID or IDs that point to the element that contain the text that needs to be read. And so we'll take a look at an example here. We're actually gonna scroll down and take an example that uses two IDs so that we can kind of see how that will get read out. So we will copy the example here and then paste it over in our play environment. And we'll notice that the ARIA labeled by attribute refer references two IDs. One that's associated with the link at RM13, and then one that's associated with that H2 at ATTR. And if we inspect that link and take a look at it in the accessibility dev tools, we'll see that the label is actually read more 13 ARI attributes you need to know. And what it's doing is concatenating the text between the link and the header there to kind of make a full phrase to describe that link. And to kind of see that in action with a screen reader, let's go ahead and open up voiceover with command F5. And we'll screen. see that it Heading reads the same uh, label that we just saw in the dev tools there. Link, read more 13 R. Which is read more 13 R attributes you need to know. So if let's say we didn't include the R labeled by there, it would just say read more, which is a common thing that you'll see on the web. However, you could have Say you had a list of 10 articles, they would all say read more. And there's not enough context to provide the assistive technology of what they're actually clicking on. So by making it so that it says read more plus the heading, this provides more context so that if there are 10 links on the page, the person knows what they're navigating to. The third attribute we'll look at is ARIA described by. This is also known as a relationship attribute and establishes semantic connections between elements on a web page. It links an element to an accessible description by referencing the ID of another element containing the descriptive text. In contrast to ARIA labeled by, this attribute can be used to provide supplementary information or contextual details for an element, rather than solely a label. Okay, so let's take the example provided on the MDN page here, and let's pivot back to our play environment like we have for other attributes and copy and paste that code over here. And if you notice, we see a button now, followed by some supplementary text. And notice that the ARIA described by attribute now points to the ID of the paragraph tag. And so if we inspect it and look at it in our accessibility dev tools, we will see that 
Um, the description is items in the trash will be permanently removed after 30 days, which is the text that's contained in the paragraph tag. So some screen readers are kind of different with how they handle reading out descriptive text. Um, but when it does read out that information, it would read out move to trash, followed by, you know, that supplementary information to kind of provide a little more context. The last ARIA attribute we'll look at is ARIA invalid, which is used to indicate that user input for an element is incorrect. It is typically used on form elements such as input fields, select menus, and text areas. The value of ARIA invalid can be set to either true or false. When set to true, it indicates that the user input is invalid and the associated form element is invalid. When set to false, it indicates that the user input is valid. Additionally, the value of ARIA invalid can be set to grammar for grammatical errors and spelling for misspelled words. So we're going to go back to our play environment here, but this time we'll take an example from the manuscript. And so here we have a label for phone number and we have the input and the pattern is incorrect. We say, and we've marked it as ARIA invalid equals true. Um, in a real world experience, you would actually um, programmatically do this, not you know, manually like I have it here, but just to prove the point, um, you know, say we have incorrect phone number entered. And I'm also going to add some CSS here by targeting are invalid when it's equal to true. Um, so let's say we assign it this maroon, this kind of reddish maroonish color. So now when are invalid equals true, the text in that input is that color. So not only can you use are invalid as a way to tell screen readers this, but we can also use it for styling. Um, and if we inspect the input element here and go to our accessibility dev tools, we'll see that um, the ARIA invalid attribute is marked as true. And if we open up our screen reader, again, with the shortcut command F5, and focus in on items. that input, we'll see that it reads out, you know, one, two, three, four, five, 45. insertion at end of text, phone number required, invalid data. Again, it could kind of vary on your browser, I think in your screen reader, how this is read out, but it notifies the listener that, okay, this is invalid data. So that, that way they can make an action to improve it or whatever. But this is kind of how the ARIA invalid attribute can come into play um, when it's reading out the text or whatever content that it's referring to. ARIA attributes give developers a powerful tool to add more meaning and context to a web page, improving its accessibility. If you want to keep learning about how to build real world apps with the latest technologies and other career related topics, then start right now by subscribing to our channel and liking this video.